Hello and welcome to the Be Positive Bloodstream, a podcast providing insights, stories and experiences from and for all those affected by acute leukaemia and beyond. My name is John Joe Rooney and I'm the founder of Be Positive and the host of the Bloodstream. So why a podcast? Well, the one thing I lacked when I was diagnosed with leukaemia back in 2006 was hearing from people who knew what it was like to embark on a similar journey to myself. It's my hope that by sharing inspiring interviews from people who have either been affected firsthand in some way by blood cancer or have had similar experiences that others can resonate with, then we can help support those in need. I want these podcasts to provide help, inspiration and belief to all people. Be Positive is both my blood group and my adopted mantra that I held throughout my treatment. I hope you enjoy our interviews and if you wish to get in touch with us, then please do so by emailing us at info at bepositive.org.uk or you can find us on Twitter at b underscore positive underscore org. In this episode, I share my own story recalling my experience in facing acute lymphoblastic leukaemia after I was diagnosed over a decade ago. I was recently asked to share my story to a group of professionals training as hemo-oncology nurses at the Royal Marsden School in London. I often spend a great deal of time talking at length to all different kinds of people affected by leukaemia about how I felt upon diagnosis and throughout my treatment. Therefore, to me, it made sense to record the talk so I can easily signpost others towards it, people who may either be about to embark on a similar journey to myself, or maybe they know someone who is. I hope you enjoy. I'm here to talk to you through, um, talk to you about my story and my experience as a patient, former patient. I think you're always a patient, really, and I'm quite pleased about that. Um, For my experience with uh, leukaemia. So I will start rambling on and tell you my story. 16th of December 2006 was an um, important date for me, uh, naturally. Two things of considerable note happened that day. The first thing <laughs> was Villa losing to Bolton. Uh, my beloved Villa losing to Bolton, in case you thought that was a good news slide. <laughs> um, and the second thing was, on that day I got told I had acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Only one of those things was a shock that day, <laughs> believe it or not, he got it, he knew. Um, <laughs> such is my uh, shambolic football team at times. Um, but no, but 16th of December, it was a Saturday, uh, a Saturday evening, because the football game I'd went to was particularly late, it wasn't a three o'clock kickoff, it was 5.15. Um, and so I got told later that evening I had acute lymphoblastic uh, leukaemia. Um, how did that happen? How did, how did that materialise? So, okay, I'd been to the football that day, weeks before, a couple of weeks before, because I had acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. You guys are absolutely experts on the science of that. You know the time frame's relatively small from when this can occur. Um, for about two weeks or so, I'd felt tremendous pain, um, breathlessness, bruising on my arms. Um, yes, I was having aches in my bones playing football. I was I had tremendous back pain. I went to the doctors, um, I'm from the West Midlands um, and my nearest hospital was Redditch where I went to school. Um, I'm from Bromsgrove so it was only 20 minutes away. I'd been there, I'd, I'd had time off work, I never have time off work. Um, I was 23 at the time I should say. I, um, I'd been to see the doctors and they'd said, oh it's probably an infection between your chest and lungs. Um, I, was, I was laid up and I thought that's fine, any amount of I think I was given antibiotics, I was given a lot of um, painkillers um, and I was taken off um, I was taken off work for a week, and again, that's um, that's unlike me. Um, so I, I was sweating. I was heavily sweating, but I got myself back to work, and that amount of um, medication and painkillers numbed the pain. So I kind of thought, oh, I must be a little bit better. I was quite yellow in my skin. The bruising hadn't subsided. I wasn't playing football. I was I was breathless. I was losing my breath a lot of the time. Um, that carried on. On the day of that game, on the day on the Saturday. I'd, um, I'd been to the football and it was a late kickoff. I'd come back home and again, I mean, a, a week or so, 10 days before that, I remember being out with my girlfriend at the time for a meal um, in Birmingham and I had this tremendous throbbing in my lower back pain to the point I had to leave my dinner. Now, if ever I'm leaving my dinner, there's a big problem. There has to be something quite serious there. So we'd left the, um, the dinner and I'd rushed home. I couldn't even drive myself home. I was pacing the room. Um, I was in tears, actually. Um, which is 23, quite a proud sort of brass 23 year old. I, I hadn't really been in tears for, for years from what I can remember, but I was pacing the room, I was in tremendous discomfort, and that's when I first recognized this throbbing sensation in my lower back. But I'd been to the hospital, they'd said it's probably an infection, I got painkillers. So fast forward a week or so, or two weeks or so, 
to the game, I started feeling this numbness in the back of my um, lower back again, sorry. And everyone had, everyone had been out. My girlfriend was with my sister at the time. It was the X Factor final when Leona Lewis won it, so no one was around. I'd come back late from the game, and my mum had said, whenever I get these pains and stuff, have a hot bath, because we didn't know. We just thought maybe that will soothe it. So I was sat in a hot bath, and it was felt progressively worse. Um, not a panicker. My mum is a panicker, but even she wasn't panicking. I was like, do you know what? This feels very um, uncomfortable. On the morning, actually, of that day, I remember I, I noticed blood spots on my legs, my lower legs, like little dots. And I remember saying to my mum, "Had you? Um, is this anything to worry about? Now, my mum was the biggest worrier, but she, she was like, no, no, I'm sure it's fine, like, you know. Um, and so I kind of didn't think anything of it. You don't think anything of it. Leukemia is a disguised disease, as you all know, and the symptoms are very much flu-related. You know, I felt like I was just really run down. But I, I wasn't really, I wasn't, ironically, ever a sick child, really, you know, until I bought the big ticket. But I, um, it would take a lot for me to um, be off school or to be off work or anything. My mum sent me to school with a broken leg once, you know, that was the type. She didn't break my leg and send me to school. She, I'll clarify that, we're not that type of family. But when I broke my leg, it was like, no, you still have to go to school, it's important. And I grew up wanting to be where I should have been. So it wasn't, things like that, being off work, didn't sit that well for me. So on that evening, they said, listen, let's go to the hospital. So I went back to Redditch. Um, and I hadn't had chance to eat, and I said, oh, I really want to get a McDonald's. Can we get a McDonald's? I said, yeah, yeah, we'll just go and get sorted. So I went to the initial um, assessment unit. I don't know if that's the correct term, but where you wait and they see you, and I had the blood spots on my legs. I'd explain the symptoms. I said, okay, we'll get you looked at. And up until this point, I hadn't had a blood test. I went to my local GP in Bromsgrove, and they'd, um, this was before that weekend, and they temporarily run out of um, the, the equipment to take blood. And they said, come back next week. I thought, fine, didn't really worry about it. Um, this is not a slating on the NHS, I think they're brilliant, but that day they didn't have the equipment. Um, felt like it could have been important looking back. Um, but anyway, I didn't, but I wasn't concerned, I wasn't panicking or anything, I just thought, okay, we'll come back next week. So the, the weekend had come, and by the time we, I got assessed, I kept getting delayed, and I was talking, you go wait in that room, and it was on the weekend, so the skeleton staff there, they didn't have all the doctors that they would normally have, um, and there was sort of on-call nurses and doctors and whatnot, so I was kind of sat waiting, um, getting assessed, getting prodded, um, and my, um, my sister, my girlfriend and my mum who'd come with me were all in a different room, so I was kind of sat waiting and waiting, and I always remember vividly my mum saying, she could kind of sense people were whispering. Now they had taken blood at this point, and then they started discussing amongst themselves, and then they were getting an on-call doctor coming in. I was um, kept waiting. My only concern was that I really want to go and get a McDonald's. Can I just get out of here? Because I didn't feel there was any panic. I wasn't with my family at this point. I was just sat sort of on a bed waiting. People come and said, oh, have you been looked at? Have you, your family here? I said, no, no. So they got this on-call doctor in, and he came and started asking me some questions. I didn't really think a great deal of it. Um, I'm quite a jovial guy, and he was, he was asking me questions. He said, how how are your balls? Oh, I thought he said balls, and I said, they're, they're fine. I'm not sure, what, I haven't had any problems with them. He said, no, no, your bowels, have you had any problem with your bowels? I said, oh, <laughs> no, 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 no problems there either. Um, I was kind of a bit confused, thinking this is, this is going a different way. He said, have you, have you, have you been having unprotected sex? Have, 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 you, have you been having anal sex? Have you been? And I said, no, your audience, I said, university was brilliant, but I, it wasn't that good. Again, just trying to warm him up a bit, but um, straight over his head. Um, but no, but he was kind of getting to the crux point, asking me all these questions, asking um, maybe, because at this point didn't know if it could be AIDS or HIV or anything like this, anything blood related. The severity certainly hadn't hit me. Um, and this um, West Indian doctor, he didn't have tremendously brilliant English, but I could just about understand what he said, so I was misinterpreting things he was saying. But he, he started, um, looking me right in the eye, when he, when he came in, I kind of felt, oh, they brought in a serious guy here. Um, but I was kind of just wanting it to, to go, and he was explaining it, and he said, you're very poorly. I said, yeah, he said, you've got a, um, you've got a very serious, you've got a blood disorder. And I said, oh, okay, and I, I was transfixed with this guy's eyes, and I said, thinking, let's get the ridiculous out of the way, am I going to die? And it's at that moment where he couldn't answer, and didn't answer, where, his seriousness that he'd been talking to me to, he was looking me right in the eye, he kind of dipped his head a bit and quite compassionately just put his hand on my arm and just, he couldn't answer it. He obviously can't tell me I'm not, but he also can't say me, like, tell me I am, there's a lot more tests that need to be done, but he just said, um, there is treatment for this. And I kind of just felt like I had a bit of an out of body experience because I'd said the most ridiculous, no, no, am I going to die? And I thought, oh shit, he, he can't answer that. 
and my family were in the room at this point. Um, my sister was bawling her eyes out. My um, my girlfriend at the time was bawling her eyes out. My mum was in total shock. I mean, they had asked me questions, like I said, about um, the bowels and the unprotected sex and is there a history of cancer and things. But they, they're relatively routine questions. You know, I didn't panic when I heard that. And the only cancer related was my granddad. And I thought, but he was obviously very old and I think he had stomach cancer that went to the liver and stuff. And I thought, but this is, you know, very different. This is flu, isn't it? Um, so I didn't really panic. But when he'd said that, I thought, serious blood disorder and I thought geez that is that is bad um, and they said listen we're going to get you upstairs because it was about one in the morning at this point Leona had fully won the x-factor at this point um, I could see it because it was on in the tellies around there the only distraction but I'd um, I got told listen you're going to go upstairs and in a few hours we're going to get you sent over to Worcester Royal where they have a um, where they'll be able to treat you there and treatment is going to have to start straight away so a nurse came in and said, um, and we were just dumbfounded, like, oh God, I'm not going home, I'm not getting to McDonald's, clearly, I'm going to have to go upstairs. And this, um, and this uh, nurse came in to kind of move me off the bed and change it and she said, are you guys all right? She said, yes. She said, listen, the thing with leukemia is, and we said, whoa, we, we haven't got that. He just said serious blood disorder. And she said, no, that, yeah, he's got leukemia. I think my sister said, he hasn't got that. They said, no, he, he's got leukemia. And I'm like, I'm just here. I'm hearing all of this. And I'm like, leukemia? I was like, that's that's small children with bold heads. I'm, without being disrespectful, that's my impression of leukemia. It's small children um, who look very sick. And I thought, well, well, what's a leukemia? What, what is it? And she said, oh, well, it's, it's cancer of the, um, of the blood. And I thought, geez, I've been hit with three bullets here, blood disorder, and then leukemia, and then cancer. And I thought, I, I, and I couldn't, I, I just felt like I was tumbling emotionally. I wear my heart on my sleeve generally, but I, was, I hadn't prepared for this. I thought the worst part of my day was Villa losing and it got significantly worse and I just, I felt, I always explain it as being somewhat of an out of body experience because I felt like I was floating, I felt like this isn't real, it's the best way I can kind of surmise it. So um, I had to go upstairs, didn't sleep a wink, I was allowed to have someone with me, um, my, 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 my girlfriend who didn't have anywhere else to go so she slept on the floor, I don't think anyone slept, but, um, but from there um, everything had to kick on. So that was how, on that frightful Saturday, I was told I had leukemia. Um, what sort of state was I in? You guys are the experts. If we took our blood reading, it may be somewhere, somewhere in that region on the left, I'm told, correct me if I'm wrong, but somewhere in that, I know it's different for male and female. Um, whereas I was at 429, for whatever reading that is. Now, I got a B at GCSE maths, and I know that's just not a good ratio for anything. If, if someone said you can have 11 chocolate bars, you, you could clear it. 429 would make you very ill. I couldn't look at those numbers and ever feel that I was in a good way. They said you are in a very serious state. Your, your illness, cancer, leukemia, is, um, is escalated um, to that level. I mean, it just wasn't good reading. And again, it was more bad news. It was more tests. It was everything. How did I feel? I felt like that, without a doubt. Um, but... But in all, in all seriousness, my initial feelings, I didn't know what this was. I didn't know what leukemia was. I didn't know what the complexities of it was. I landed at Worcester Royal Hospital and was given these booklets because um, they thought that was helpful. It might have been. Every patient's different. I didn't want to open anything that would scare the life out of me. Uh, I was in tears all the time. And this is, this is hours after I'd been diagnosed. I was not going to read a textbook on this illness. Um, I, I said to my family listen please can you just take that away and read it and just tell me the positive stuff because I can't have any bad stuff. My, my real fear um, in these initial feelings was being told you have X amount to live, X amount of time to live. I hadn't heard that thankfully, I certainly didn't want to ask it but I thought well, I haven't been told that and they said there is treatment for this illness. I just grabbed onto that and thought well that's it. It's amazing how you end up compromising and from where I was earlier that Saturday, thinking I haven't been that well, but you know, football and everything, to suddenly thinking, God, at least there's treatment to keep me alive. It, it's a staggering 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, but my initial feelings were dumbfounded, very scared, um, as I'm sure everyone's is. I know some people get diagnosed with leukemia and get slightly more preparation if they say you have an illness that might turn into something. Mine felt totally out of the blue. I didn't know anyone my age. I mean, I was 23. I thought this was young children and I heard it was very old people. I felt like I was completely lost in this. But I was frightened to hear more about it really. I was having new doctors, new nurses come and meet me all the time. I had my Redditch doctor who I had to hand over to Worcester who were talking to Birmingham because I probably would have needed a transplant. What's a transplant? What am I having? All this scary stuff. Meetings after meetings. 
Um, I, w I was very, very scared and it felt like it was non-stop. Um, I was told straight away, you, you're looking at two years of treatment here. So everything was just s such a lot to take in. Um, every time I turned on the telly, because I was in my isolated room or opened the newspaper, I would see a leukemia story. I would see something that was negative. It was either about death or cancer or leukemia. Having never heard it before that day, I suddenly couldn't stop seeing it. It reminded me of when I was buying my Peugeot 206 straight after uni, one of my first car. I thought I'm going to get a black one, three door, sport model. And everyone in Bromsgrove had one. And I was like, I didn't see that before, but now I want one, I can see it. And I couldn't get away from leukemia. Everything around me was um, was was shouting leukemia and death, and it was uh, and it was and it was hard. I mean, bad news travels more than good. We know it makes news because people needed donors and different people of different ethnicities were needing help for leukemia. It was just frightening the life out of me. Whilst I was a trying to come to terms with my own illness, b trying to sort of educate myself on what this is, and c just trying to get through each day at that at that stage. Um, feeling isolated. Obviously, I'm put in isolation. Um, as you guys well know, um, but I, I always feel that the most important thing for me was how isolated I felt. I had tremendous support from family and friends. That didn't matter so much. I mean, of course it mattered, but what I needed was, I need to know someone's come through this and come out the other end. I haven't ever met anyone who's had leukemia. I didn't think I had. I didn't know if people can come out the other end. I, I just didn't know what the future held in store for me, but I felt if I could see someone who's done it, I'd grab on onto that with both hands and, and, and use that as my sort of inspiration. Now, in my high school, a year or so below me was a lad called Rowan, and my sister said, oh, do you remember Rowan, Kaney? Because she was friends with his older brother. My sister's a couple of years older than me. And she said, Rowan had leukemia, and he had a transplant, and he's absolutely fine now. And I thought, wow, has he? First person I'd ever heard of that I could know. Um, and I said, this is fantastic. Please, can we get in touch? We got in touch. I said, yeah, of course, ask any questions. So through my sister, through to Stuart, his brother, and back to Rome, we were asking questions. That felt great for me. I felt I had something to grip onto. And I felt like I could fire all these questions away. And, and I did. And was getting a lot back. And I just felt, you know what, Romans did this. Did Every day I was had more questions, of course. Um, and then my sister came and said, at one point, and she dropped it in. It's not her fault at all. She just dropped it in. Oh, by the way, Roman didn't have leukemia. He had aplastic anemia. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt I'd pinned all my hopes on replicating this guy's journey and outcome and it absolutely knocked me for six i was fragile emotionally i was crying most days um having gripped onto something like that and to be told and had it felt like it had been swept away from under my feet really hit me for six listen the worst still positive of course he'd come through a blood cancer he'd had a transplant he's doing great now all that was brilliant it just took me a while to change my thinking to go back to being positive and to trying to grab onto this but that was a big bump in the road um, that is me quite soon after being um, diagnosed. Um, you can see my Hickman line patch on the right hand side there. Um, but bumps in the road is something I just wanted to touch on next because there are bumps in the road as we know. That rowing thing was a huge one. You have bumps in the road perhaps doesn't do with justice. Obviously it's like a roller coaster. You have massive bumps, you have little bumps. Um, but sometimes it's only the little things that actually can overwhelm you you know when you, you when you're probably suppressing a lot you don't have chance to move when you're a patient you're on this conveyor belt straight away I couldn't go home and digest it I was in isolation I was being prodded and tested and hooked up to things having hitman lines and steroids and chemotherapy and all this um, I wasn't obviously allowed you know it's the small things that matter I wasn't allowed um, food that could could be contaminated or have any bacteria so everything had to be vacuum formed um, people, everyone was bringing me grapes, but I wasn't allowed them unless they peeled them. And I had friends saying, I don't care how ill he is, I'm not peeling these grapes for him. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not king. Um, so I had to peel my own grapes. But, um, but I was having vacuum formed food and little things like that would give me just a little bit of joy in the day. I remember um, instructing, I think, the auxiliary nurse, I'd said to the guy, oh, I've got this um, ginsters thing. I said, listen, I'll, can I just have that 30 seconds on, big 30 seconds on the packet? said, that'll do, that's all it needs. If I can have that heated up, that'd be brilliant. And he came back and just said, listen, to be sure I put it in for two minutes. And I was like, oh, it was cardboard. It was gone. And it deflated me a little bit. It sounds ridiculous, but I was like, that one thing is probably what I was looking forward to today. And you've nuked it. To be safe for a good reason, but it hit me for six. I might have cried at that. I'm not even sure. Um, but it is the small things that matter. Um, now you encounter, okay, one of the first things when I was diagnosed, and I haven't actually shared this story in another talk, but because we've got a bit more time, I will do. Um, 24, 48 hours after I'd been diagnosed with leukemia, they started talking to me about fertility. I was 23 at the time. Um, they said, listen, 
the treatment you have you're going to have is very likely to make you fertile if you have radiotherapy and transplant that's almost certain to make you fertile um, now actually selfishly I wasn't too concerned about that I've spoke to patients since a lot younger than me and they were younger than me when they were diagnosed and had that chance wiped away from them and they said that that was worse for them than being told they were ill and had cancer for me it wasn't I was so scared of my own life I just thought listen I, I don't even know if I want kids I'm 23 I just I'm not worried about that yet I just want to get better um, you know so I got told I have to I have to um, donate my I donate my sperm I had to um, produce it um, the next day I got told a guy from Birmingham a taxi driver is going to be outside the hospital at 10 a.m. the next morning no pressure just, I can just picture this guy with a cigarette waiting for me watching his watch um, the clinical nurse specialist a lovely lady dotty Becky I called her because she had a dotty top and there was about five Beckys in Worcester um, she she came and said listen um, she was the one who was talking me through this and saying listen, you're gonna have to do this this is the implications of the treatment um, so first thing in the morning we have to move this fast because I had to have treatment imminently due to the white blood cell count and how I presented and she said first thing in the morning you're gonna have to do this she came in with these adult magazines um, to, to, ahead for me to just take a look at and to use in the morning I remember saying without being too graphic video works better for me but if this is all we've got <laughs> it wasn't a DVD shop there from what I remember but I had to make use with um, these magazines, Razzle, Pirate, all these strange names. They were her ex-boyfriends, just to you know, get in your head a little bit more. Um, anyway, so, I, and I am quite jovial. I was making light of things. I think in that time when I was, I didn't sleep at all that night, and I didn't probably, and probably a subconscious worry that I thought, Jesus, this is, um, this is really quite uh, serious. This is actually my only hope of having a child. I've got to get up. Um, the last thing I feel like doing is producing sperm, if I'm honest. Um, so anyway, first thing in the morning, and they said, listen, we're going to block off the room and have no entry signs and things like that, so you're not going to be disturbed or anything. I thought, that's brilliant. So you can probably tell what's coming. But I, um, first thing in the morning, I think, well, let's, let's get into the zone about half six, seven o'clock. I hadn't slept a wing. Um, trousers around the legs, controlled temperature, so, you know, I'm topless, trousers around the legs, without trying to be graphic. This is how it is, but you guys are the professionals and you will have seen similar things. Um, so I'm sat there and I thought, let's give this a go. Um, nothing was happening, absolutely nothing was happening. Um, and you, you know the bed buttons that you have? I think when I slept, I'm so panicked, I'm needing it in the night because I had cancer now that I might need a bed button. I think I must have laid that down by my pillow. So when I was propped up, all I remember at one point was the Zimbabwean nurse charity <laughs> burst through the door, come in with me in all my glory. And I said, what on earth are you doing here? And she was pointing to the light that I'd activated to ask them to come in. <laughs> and I was there trying to get some progress. And I went, Jesus Christ, can you please just get in? And she went, no. And bless her, she went, no problem. She came over, put that on and said, no problem. Hung up my bed buzzer and went away and I thought, it doesn't get worse than this. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so that's in my head as I'm trying to get some momentum. Um, it was like, playing snooker with a piece of rope. There was nothing happening, absolutely nothing. I couldn't get out of my head. The severity, I was like, Jesus, this is absolutely appalling. And I thought, right, focus, focus, focus. This taxi driver's outside. Focus, <laughs> focus, focus. And then the door slams, op slams open again and the, um, the Down syndrome cleaner, John, had come in with his mop and just <laughs> casually. And I went, what are you doing here? What, what is this guy doing here? And I said, John, get out. And I heard the nurses, John, you're not allowed in there. They hadn't put up the no entry signs. They shut the blinds, bless them, but that was about it. And he walked in and said, don't worry about that, no problem, and carried on. I was like, <laughs> it felt like I was in a, in a nightmare. And, um, and he went out and I thought, oh my God. And a, a, an hour or two had passed. I said, I'm really struggling here. I'm absolutely struggling for it. Let's give it one more go. So I carried on and carried on. Tried and tried, felt like I was having some semblance of um, success with it. Now, in my isolated room, there was a, sh a short window because I'm a few floors up right there and it was behind me uh, to the side of me actually um, and I was thinking come on come on do this now at this point the taxi driver had long gone they said don't worry about the taxi driver for these interruptions this is clearly taking longer we'll get them recouriered don't worry about that I thought great that's one thing off my mind now we'll try and do the biz um, and I just saw the window cleaner chamois come against the window <laughs> third time's a charm and I just went oh, I mean the, the window was getting massaged beautifully and I just thought <laughs> this is what I know and, and, and I just thought you know what I can't do this I cannot do this this isn't happening and I called the nurse in I was in tears it's one of my favourite stories because I think it's very humorous but at the time I felt quite distressed and I was emotional I was like I can't, I can't do this what can I do I cannot do this and they said listen would it help if we call your girlfriend I said yes so they called her and a good 16 seconds later we got it done that was fine <laughs> 
but basically that was a bump in the road and all the trauma my dad who I told not to tell anyone when I shared this story to him he was in fits of laughter told the professor and the professor's son he had glasses off and I went I mean it went around the whole uh, it went around the whole ward but that was a um, that was a bump in the road now there were many of these um, getting slightly more serious now when I I think I, I developed a blood clot from the asparaginase um, treatment I had which I think I'm sure you guys know is quite common um, and, and, a, and a common side effect for that I I had it in my lower calf it felt like tremendous cramp and they said look we're going to um, we're going to get you looked at first thing in the morning so okay you can't go anywhere and watch about them wheeling you there it's not like Birmingham where you have to walk all around the old building get your lifts on yourself they came and said we're going to take you in a wheelchair so I got wheeled into this room with the guy, the ultrasound guy was there with rubber gloves and a bottle of KY jelly and I walked in and I shouldn't have said it but I thought again, know your audience, I said I'm not sure what you're here for mate but I'm only here for the blood clot. <laughs> it went straight over his head, he just said can you, uh, can you just sit down please Mr Rooney and I thought oh. <laughs> So anyway, another bump in the road was that um, side effects of asparaginase so then I was on blood thinning which complicated my treatment and then I became a case study and I was signing consent for everything um, but it was nevertheless another, um, another bump in the road. Now all the treatments, all the chemotherapy I'm having um, showed me what my blood group was. What's your name? I'm, I am John Joe, but officially it's John Rooney. Um, blood group B positive. And I thought, Jesus, my own blood here is telling me to be positive. I've got all my family telling me to be positive. I'm very much quite a, uh, a symbolic guy. I'd studied English at, uh, literature, I'd, I'd studied poetry. I loved the fact that this, I was getting a message from my own blood. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to do this. My sister said, you should keep a journal for this. You should track your illness because it'd be, be a bit of routine for yourself and it might help people in the, down the line. Um, so I started keeping a journal and about a week, into it into my treatment I'd tracked back a week and started writing every single day that became a real lifestyle for me it became a sense of routine I felt like I had a grip of control on the illness a bit um, I wouldn't leave a day without writing it I signed every day off with B positive because I knew that meant something I thought that's brilliant that is um, I'm gonna have that as my adopted mantra so I did um, and I recorded everything blood sweat and tears everything went into that journal every single day no matter how ill I felt no matter how angry I felt Villa didn't win for 18 games when I was in hospital that all went in there with tears um, but it was important and it felt like I had a bit of a grip on something and I got some routine because you're, you're thrown out of your normal life and you're just in on a convey about a treatment um, this was a real saving grace for me um, so inspiration and hope now you get certain people certain things inspired me I was given I was inundated people wanted to help they gave me DVDs they gave me um, magazines, anything that could maybe help me with my interest, if it was just little things like um, lads magazines or football magazines or nice books. The one thing that stood out, I was, maybe it was the steroids, I had no attention span um, for anything. I, I wasn't interested in, um, in anything. And my friend came in with a Tesco bag full of definitely pirate DVDs that all these latest films were on there. Don't know how he got them, but um, he said, here you go, have these. So I thought, this is fantastic. But I, I started watching stuff and I'd lost interest straight away. I saw one and it was called Long Way Round and it was um, Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman. They'd cycle, they didn't cycle, they um, were on motorbikes going the long way around from London to New York through Russia, Mongolia and all that. And it gripped me. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's, really, it's, it's great. And it was, um, they'd done a couple of scenes, but this was the first one I thought, I'd never seen it, I thought it was a film, and, and I was gripped instantly, I thought this is a documentary, I thought this is brilliant. And without sounding corny or cheesy, I thought these are on a journey, and these are having struggles, and I was willing them all the way. And it was the first thing that made me, not forget about my illness, but put my mind to something else and will them on. And I was in tears watching them, they were having struggles, and I thought, well I'm having struggles, and they were going, having ups and downs. Of course they could have cancelled it and got home, but I didn't put myself to that plow. I didn't, I didn't relate it too closely. I just thought this is absolutely something I can take inspiration from. And I really did. Um, and the struggles they encountered um, on the brink of giving up and everything, I really tried to um, take that as inspiration to help me through my own journey. That was really um, important to me. Uh, and actually, if I ever get to meet you, I'm definitely going to tell him that because it helped me through and I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but it's a good ending and it meant a lot and I really sort of willed them on to the point I felt a bit sad after it had finished because I missed that I wanted something that would replicate that and it was probably reminded me but I'm still on my journey I've got two years of this and they come home but I didn't actually dwell on the negative of that I was so inspired by it I was given the books from it and then the, the further book from it the, the, the next time they did one it really helped but people also inspired me this guy Peter uh, huge inspiration he was about 60 years old he 
um, or late 50s, he, he was diagnosed at a similar time to me and throughout my treatment I would see him pop up um, at Birmingham and, and when we were in Worcester we shared a neutropenic bay together. We were all neutropenic so I had to get put out of my isolation room and had to get, um, uh, and we were in a four man bay and Peter was next to me and this guy came in and I thought oh what's he, um, who's this guy and we started chatting as you do um, throughout the day and he was he just did not worry about a thing. He was like, yeah, this is absolutely fine. He, I, I mean, I was just sat there being a cancer patient, looking like a cancer patient, thinking I'm not sure what I can do. He was saying, listen, John Joe, if you break your leg, you go to the hospital, they fix it up and you go home. That, that's what we're doing here. Might take a bit longer, but we're all here to get fixed. He had a tremendous positive attitude, which was really quite infectious. I was blown away because every day he had his laptop open looking at pie charts and um, projections and he was having people visit him in suits and an absolute high flyer. I mean, they all had to wear the apron and do the alcohol rub. No one gets away with that, but they looked a bit uncomfortable. But when they would come, he was having business meetings at his bay, uh, his bed. And I thought, this is absolutely unreal. And a few days after, I thought, oh my God, he's having really sort of high round meetings. I thought, I've got to ask him what he does. Um, he's in charge of this, he's telling him to do this, he's telling him to do that. They're all having these serious meetings. And I said, Peter, what is it, um, what is it you do? Think he's got a, he's got a top Apple or Microsoft or something like that, and he said, "I work for the company that provide the batter mix for donuts at Alton Towers," <laughs> and I, I, I didn't. I, anyone that works any job is absolutely brilliant. It wasn't quite the answer I expected. It blew me away, and I think I was hide, hiding the laughter because I thought this is absolutely brilliant. But behind that message was actually that this is what's getting him through his day. He's putting his mind to this so he can focus and feel useful again. And just like I did with Long Way Round, I attained, put my brain to something else and I could focus on it. So I was blown away by that. Not the answer I got, but actually it taught me a lot about his approach. And all through that approach, and I'm very pleased to say he's doing very well. Um, I mean, when he would get sent home for a, day, for a couple of days, he'd be in Belfast having meetings. He was just driven. And he, um, and I'm, you know, I was really pleased to see him doing well. He would knock my window when I was having my transplant and wave. I couldn't get away from him. But, um, but I was really inspired by him. So I was told that I had a potential for a transplant. Now, it was slightly conflicting because you can obviously treat leukemia. Not everyone needs a transplant. It's a great cost to have it. You have to match. There's a lot of complications. A lot of people get treated with chemo only. The thought of a transplant scared me. And I remember getting told, oh, we've got potentials for it, which is brilliant news. But for me, it felt like, oh, this is a bit of a reality. I'm actually going to possibly have a transplant. Then when I was told what, what a transplant is, it said, oh, it's just what you've had, blood transfusions. It's obviously just another blood transfusion. So I thought, OK, let's go and, um, OK, let's, let's go for that. And they said, listen, this is your best um, chance of leukemia never returning. But it's obviously my choice. So once I learned a bit about it and said, blood transfusion, that sounds fine. I had to go to Birmingham. I was neutropenic at the time. I had to go and speak to the team at Birmingham. And my mum took me there, so I was neutropenic, so you can't be around crowds, and I was, didn't want to be near anyone who was coughing. It was raining, it was sort of February, March time, and it was, the weather was awful. And we were getting there, mum couldn't park the car in Birmingham, it was because it's obviously so busy. I had to go in for the appointment. My um, amazing consultant, um, Dr. Prem Mahendra, wasn't available, so they had uh, the registrar there, who has been nicknamed Dr. Doom, for how he <laughs> approaches his news. Um, amongst us patients um, I had this chat with him and it felt like it was just it was supposed to be a 15 minute chat and it was just telling me my life in numbers the likelihood of elapsing your mortality rate I was waiting for mum to park the car we'd been rushed I'd sat in I didn't have prem I, I had um, this guy who just felt like he was dealing me bad news after bad news hitting with more bullets and more bullets it, it honestly felt worse than being diagnosed I think for how bad I took it I think because I felt I'd been doing so well which I had through chemo um, the, I was in remission, the, treat, uh, the cancer had gone, and we know the big challenge is making sure it stays gone. Um, but with a transplant, it felt like I was going back to square one, and that actually, this is such a high risk thing. When actually I feel fine at the moment, can't we carry on with this? Because this all feels fine. Um, and the choice was with me. Listen, of course we can go with just chemo, but history tells us that you're very likely to relapse because of how high you presented and things like that. So it scared the life out of me. Seeing your life in numbers is something I'll never really get used to. I got bombarded with information in that chat. Dr. Prem Mahendra came back in for the latter part of it, and I think they were surprised that I was in tears. But I hadn't been briefed for what I was about to hear. And that isn't a complaint, I just think something was missing. And some people weren't as fragile as I was, so they would have just took that news very differently. It just felt like another bullet for me. I felt like I'd doing so well, and maybe I had a bit of blind optimism, actually. 
this can carry on, I might not need a transplant. Hearing the severity of it, hearing what it entails, did scare the life out of me. Um, but I picked myself up, I knew Rowan, other people who'd gone through it, this was the best chance for me, so I was gonna have to go through more um, treatment, get very sick, but for the better end point. Um, so obviously I decided to go through that, and I'm very lucky because I had the option of a transplant. I've since learned that so many people don't have that option, and I think it's grossly unfair that it's almost an ethical lottery on who gets one. It's who's on the list. It's just a matching game. Um, and I think that's unfair. But, so I should have really felt far more lucky. But my initial feeling was actually fear that I had to have it. Um, which, it, you know, I don't mind admitting. But I was very glad that they could find a donor. They, they did match my brother and sister. Or they tested my brother and sister who didn't match me. But they matched each other, which was a nice one to their younger brother. Um, so god forbid they need it but at least they're covered um so i couldn't so they had a couple of potentials and then they obviously found one which i'll come on to this is me during my transplant um with the stem cells being fed through there a couple of pictures that's me looking very bold the radiotherapy will absolutely knock your hair out still retains the handsomeness you probably agree <laughs> uh the can of coke obviously through a straw because i developed severe mucositis um from mouth to exit i was burnt and i i was on very high dose of morphine. I think there was a national shortage due to the war in Afghanistan and things. They said they, every patient has a slightly limited amount now than they would perhaps give. But I was on the maximum quota um, for, for, for a patient in this situation. The pain was severe. I was high as a kite for days. Um, watching these drips go down, my mum would come and see me in Birmingham in my isolated room and I wouldn't surface at all. It was, it was very, um, probably quite um, emotionally draining for her. But um, I came through it and just under four weeks I, I left um, and my before I started my recovery obviously I had my stem cells which were donated by um, a guy in Germany which um, I think the Germans are far well educated on blood cancer and bone marrow and the importance of it and I think they get incentives in schools to um, donate because they get like food tokens and things like this I think that whole setup is absolutely fantastic and there are, there are things in place in this country but I think we've got a long way to go to get more people on the register to, to, to save more people um, so I had a recovery where I was told listen you're going to be very fatigued you're going to be um, not for six, you'll have to have your bed downstairs, you'll have to park right close to a um, supermarket. It wasn't actually that accurate. I, I could go upstairs, I made sure I did to try and get myself slightly fit, but I was very sick. I had um, rests, I had to have afternoon naps. It was like being a child again, I was tended. I couldn't go far, wasn't fatigued, but it took a while, but I gradually, gradually started getting my feet back on the ground. I could reassess what I wanted to do. I was perhaps in the fortunate position. I didn't have kids, a mortgage or anything. I lived at home with mom. I didn't have the um, overheads that some other people obviously have. Um, I could reassess what I wanted to do in my career. I didn't want to go back to that job. I'd made that decision. I thought, listen, I've got a chance here. Let's do what I want to do. Let's pick my path quite carefully. But it gave me that time. But before that, I wanted to start feeling useful. Um, there was a cancer patients writing group. They came round at Birmingham and a lady called Mandy Ross was starting one a very small group in the centre of Birmingham in the library. Um, so I lived 20 minutes away or half an hour away on the train. Um, so once a week I would try and get into that and it felt great, I could start feeling useful again. Um, I wasn't having the naps at this point. So as the months went by, I was starting feeling stronger. I was getting checked regularly for my bloods. Um, I did have a stint back in hospital, which again hit me for six, but they said, this is normal. You're gonna pick up bugs, it's very normal. But it was with a new, new load of people and it was very strange. It felt like, again, going back a few steps and actually, that wasn't because they said it's probably more surprising if you don't get this and come back. They told me all, all the way, you're going to come back in hospital. I just wanted to not believe it. I thought when I'd left the hospital, I was done. But I went back for a stint and I was recovering. I went to this cancer patients group and it made me feel useful again. It made me feel like I had a purpose. And I started feeling like I was getting myself back on track. Um, feeling alive is what I say because it did make me feel alive. Um, I started campaigning. I started starting to do running exercises, finding leukemia charities and the, the people who'd given me the uh, handbook, Leukemia Lymphoma Research, they're now Bloodwise. I started um, campaigning for them. Um, Anti Nolan had a scheme called Register and Be a Lifesaver where they were, just what I've said about the Germans who are far more educated on this, they wanted to get a scheme where you could educate um, people around the country to get people to donate in organs, blood and bone marrow. So I joined that. Um, I think they used me as a bit of the face of the campaign. It was on behalf of the late Adrian Sudbury, who's, um, who conflicted two different types of leukemia, and his wish as he was passing away was that more people could 
know about the bone marrow register so that is up and running and when it was at its inception i was a big part of that for them um i felt useful i was raising money i was going and handing out medals at runs and fun runs and things like that and it just made me feel great again and i felt like i could give back a bit having been on the receiving end of such care um that register in the lifesaver campaign went to parliament so i got to go to parliament and speak to ed balls he didn't have his dancing shoes on then for anyone who knows that um but he was a big big supporter of this um and um so it's very good to have his back in but it was putting me in places that again made me feel like i had a bit of a voice and that actually people are listening to all of us it was a combined effort um 2012 was a big year i got nominated to carry the olympic torch the next few sli slides were a bit of showboating should have brought it but i didn't thought that on the train here earlier um absolutely milked it on july the first there's another picture police escort of course because of the amount of fans um that's me receiving the flame because you get your own torch but you i received it from another guy who was nominated i think eight thousand people were nominated uh, were chosen from about um I think there's a couple of hundred thousand were nominated and it came for the leukemia charity who through the work i'd done through raising money and awareness and things they put me forward and as a bombarded and absolutely um amazed to have been chosen it was honestly the proudest moment of my life it was absolutely fantastic it was a great time in the country so to be a little part of that was great um more pictures of me just milking it if i'm honest um okay so my blood group was be positive now i'd written my journal i knew i wanted to do something i felt useful at this point i was meeting people i was if you said leukemia around bromsgrove you thought of me because not many people know people who had it and people through people were saying oh so-and-so's got leukemia they can touch a donjo he's doing well so i was getting um not in on day but i was getting the occasional people getting in touch asking if i could share any experience and stuff and the first person was through a colleague of where i used to work where my mom worked um at the architect's practice one of the directors he had a colleague in a friend in south africa who was undergoing uh, leukemia and he got in touch and we became friends and he was about six months behind me and we were just communicating I was sharing my experiences and every day he was like a pen pal and for six years we um, we were chatting and we got to meet and he came down to London I had people a little girl in Italy someone had um, got in touch with sorry a little girl in the Philippines um, for my friend he's he was out in the Philippines and his girlfriend at the time was um, doing care work and this little girl was getting in touch what well, her parents were and I wrote to them and then I was getting videos sent it, it, just by the power of sharing your story it was reaching people and it was helping make a difference i had a guy who was living out in italy who'd got into it so people started to find out about it the w word of mouth was spreading and it was fantastic and i wanted it to tag on to be positive i knew i mean i'm, I'm a designer i'm a design manager for macmillan cancer support at the moment um and a photographer and all these different creative things i wanted to use my creativity for something related to this so in my spare time before i'd got a job i was branding up be positive i didn't know what it was didn't know where it would be but i thought i wanted to look like something so i started doing that I was invited to give a talk quite similar to this um, um, from a guy hugely admired called John Reeve. He was he's a trustee at Luke, uh, Bloodwise, but Leukemia Lymphoma Research. And I was asked to give a patient talk, uh, and Adele Fielding was there. Um, and I gave my talk, and we chatted afterwards, and we were very inspired to listen. They need more of these because it was just a one-off talk for ALL patients, the exact illness I've had. And I chatted, and on the back of that, I had people coming to me saying, "My husband's got this. Can you talk to them?" And I said to John, "This I want to do more of this. I branded up Be Positive. I think we can do." more of this and i want it to shape up in my own way we spoke to bloodwise and leukemia lymphoma research they said listen that's great we could have you as a page on our website i wanted more than that i wanted my own thing i thought this is this can be better than this this can be i don't want to be handcuffed by other people i, I want to be able to be a bit free with this and i'd developed it so i created the brand and the logo to represent connecting and sharing all i wanted was when i trace back to how i felt wanting to see and speak and hear from someone who'd gone through the illness and come out the other end perhaps um i wanted someone who understood and i think my mum would have wanted someone to understand my friends needed someone to understand it i wanted some kind of a community feel that everyone who'd been touched in any way by leukemia or any illness can um come together and share stories or hear from people so that's really what i wanted to do so we got set up as an officially registered charity um i had a team of trustees i've got secretary um, treasurer patron is Adele Fielding um, who is like Beckham of the acute leukemia world she, she's very senior as I'm sure you guys all know big support uh, absolutely amazing person the foundations were built from people who'd been affected in some way that wasn't a mandatory it was just that's where people's passion come from um, people had either lost people or um, had been um, going through it themselves in, in, in some shape or form so we became real and this was 2013 and 14 
I, this was some press that we were getting for getting national uh, or sort of recognition for the charity, various bits of marketing collateral. It started to become something social, we're talking about it. It was going beyond my small town of Bromsgrove. It was through digital platforms, getting people from um, all around the country, getting in touch. We had an online community at the time, which we haven't got anymore because I think all the charities are doing it and they've got far more clout, so we signpost to them. But at the time we had one, and I always remember this lady called Helen got in touch and I was we were kind of helping her through the emails and talking to her and sharing experience. Um, as I'd done through John in South Africa and various things and I said listen we've got this online community there's other people in your boat that you might want to chat to and she said I'm too scared to go near it I said that's absolutely fine she said well I'll have a look but that's fine I, I don't think I'll contribute and I saw naturally that she must have seen something that triggered something someone was behind her in their treatment and she started communicating with them and started helping them and I think she felt great and she got back into it saying I can't believe how well it made me feel and how good it made me feel to help someone else so it started to make um, make waves if you will um, so we were fully branded up people running for us challenging themselves putting themselves through various uh, um, various challenges marathons and whatnot we were online we have bulletins which we um, collect people's stories now and we share them we're now moving on to interviews on uh, podcasts or something I want to move on to I can get bite-sized information that when I was in hospital later I'd like to digest that and hear about things that I don't get a chance to because I can't find it out there but I I can't hear from Adele Fielding that much I can't hear from my consultant I can't hear from other patients so that's really where we're moving towards with it Um, so where am I okay so to launch the charity and to have a big kind of stab at this and a big flagship event my donor was from Hamlin well he donated in Hamlin he's from nearby in Hanover and I thought, let's do something to launch our charity. So we established the hero of Hamlin, the hero being the donor. And I'd written to my donor, um, it had to be anonymous at the time to go for Auntie Nolan, who screened it and whatnot, absolutely fine. And I didn't hear back, and it's probably, I wrote to him when I was just recovering. Um, so a couple of years later, we were starting this up, and I thought, well, I'm gonna write again. I didn't hear back, but that's absolutely his prerogative. I explained what I was going to do, cycle, my plan was to cycle from Birmingham, where I had my cells, to the hospital in Hamlin where he donated his cells, 500 miles, um, I had to get myself a road bike, I had to get myself fit and everything, I had a team of us to do it, um, but the hero of Hamlin was going to be the idea, we would hopefully get some press, which we did, and we started to uh, kick that on. I hadn't heard anything from him, um, and and I'll come to that. So that's that's the logo we developed for it. Obviously the Pied Piper's from Hamlin, so we jumped on that, and the aim was let's get to the statue in the middle of Hamlin, and then get to the hospital. So that was our goal, and let's hopefully meet my donor. That was really the thing that would hold it together, the story, the, the thing that could hold it together for a, I suppose from a, for an emotional side for myself, but it also meant in the meantime I could raise money, raise awareness, so we raised money for ourselves as a very small start of charity, but anti Nolan and Leukemia and Lymphoma Research or Bloodwise, we would split the money across them. Um, oh, I slid that little slide in there because we did a bit of press and promo. Um, I was working at the Sunday Times at the time, so we got in their studio, started getting in their national newspapers, started getting a bit more press and attention, happily took the limelight with that. Um, we were fundraising, people were donating, we were raising lots of money. It was September 2014. We departed Birmingham, a team of six, with a big army of fans. We had support trucks, and so two people were, were providing support, and we made our way. Made it in the Independent on page three. Um, too many page three jokes went round at the time, but um, I had absolutely no idea that was going in. They'd spoke to Leukemia Lymphoma Research, who'd said, I'm okay to um, have my story shared by some press, they didn't say which, and then it was, turned out it was in the Independent, people started coming towards me. The day we left on the BBC website, the national website, it was the um, joint most read article, which was transplant man cycles to meet donor next to a jihadist story. So I thought we must be doing well for <laughs> column inches here. Um, but th- while things were happening, this is all spiraling out of control, but it was fantastic to see. I was having online, um, not online, on the phone, interviews and chats and getting on radio and things. It was absolutely fantastic. We made it to Hamlin. That's the statue behind us. That's six of us made it um, cycled for about six days. Um, 500 miles, 800 kilometres. There's the champagne shot at the uh, at the at the statue, and I got to meet Andreas. A really proud moment in my life. Um, a huge, huge moment in my life. We're since friends. He was a bit overwhelmed. Not sure he loved the villa shirt I gave him as a sort of welcome. I was wearing my Germany um, cup winners top at the time for a little bit of a nod to him. Um, 
he'd messaged a day before we met him had never heard from him and he said oh yeah I, I um yeah we're all good to meet and I didn't think I was meeting him but we were getting there anyway and it was all set up that we'd meet him and then John Reeve who cycled with us who helped form be positive when he asked me to do that first talk he'd got in touch with the mayor of um, Hamlin who wanted to meet us it was making news there and we had people coming out in the streets seeing what all the hoo-ha was about um, it was making some press over there in the German newspapers that's me and Andreas he's now a friend a lovely guy very quiet guy it's a lot of attention for him which I had to be quite sort of um, respectful of but he, he was brilliant he he was all aboard and he him and his girlfriend came and met us it was a hugely it was quite an emotional moment I hadn't given much thought to that moment of meeting him and he had to walk all the way along that street cobbled street after we'd parked the the bikes and we'd reached it and the other guys left me to it so it was a long walk on my own where I it all just started I started allowing it to come back to me of the importance of it because we were cycling having a load of fun and actually the reason was to meet this guy but to raise awareness he'd heard about it he'd seen it on um, social media on his local news and things like that he'd read up since I messaged him he'd read all about myself and be positive and he you know he in his own words said he was quite blown away by how all this whole event is named after him and everything it's quite overwhelming for him um, but that was a really special moment and really kind of set the charity off and and for me put a little bit of a cap on my recovery and felt like I was I was recovered now and obviously I get yearly checkups and things which I'm very pleased to do and I think it's important but I um, but that event kind of set us off with be positive showed that we can help other people but also meant for the first time I can kind of try and not put my illness behind me but move forward from being a patient now and maybe you know carry on to help other people um, I think I just wanted to talk about I suppose what you learn from it um, and how my experience may um, give maybe some learnings to people in, in a professional remit such as yourself so I've called this you fine bunch um, I think what's important is as a patient you're desperate for normality you only ever want to get back to your normal life you want to escape the hospital you run away from the doctors and the nurses you, you just want to get back but actually it's important I think and I certainly found I, I didn't want to forget the doctors or, or the nurses I wanted to they'd helped me so much along the way I think you carry them with you um, you cannot underestimate the importance of doctors and hematology nurses they're absolutely for me they're your, they're your safety net I think we we carry them through I found um, they have such tremendous attention and care to detail for yourself and there was many sort of lonely nights when I was crying and people in a similar position to yourself and my team were spending time in their shift uh, after their shift rather spending their personal time watching me cry listening to me cry listening to me try and play Wonderwall because I was learning guitar and Tuni there I mean she couldn't understand Wonderwall and that was because my playing was so bad if you can't understand Wonderwall you're not good at guitar so um, but she gave her time to listen to me and she knew it was important and this was all in their own hours it meant so much I think they become your I said safety net I think they become your your network of family and friends through this period it was quite hard to leave Worcester because I felt I'd had months and months and months of a family who knew me and then I had the same at Birmingham um, but you know you're taking that step you carry people with you um, you guys are with patients and people like me every every step of the way I find um, and, it, and it matters it matters to people um, of all the nurses and all the doctors I've seen that firsthand I remember when I was on morphine very heavily um, heavily on morphine and perhaps sedated I was gone with the um, fairies and I'm usually quite chatty and I remember then a lady had come into um, one of the cleaners to just sweep up and I normally chat to her a lot of the time I was probably I was lay up in bed I couldn't um, I, I wasn't really awake I wasn't with it and I heard her weeping as she was sort of sweeping around the room I heard her crying to herself and I, I I could be wrong I'm pretty sure that was because our normal repertoire was to have a bit of banter and to be quite lively and jovial and I quite look forward to that each day but I was in no place to do that and I got the sense that she was taking that on herself and that was everyone the cleaners the doctors the nurses they all cared um, and then little did that nurse uh, that auxiliary nurse know that I'd could hear that but I did and, and I think you take things like that away from you which I'm not sure you guys would ever be told but I'm telling you personally that's what we did you don't forget your doctors and nurses you absolutely don't they carried you through I think the darkest days that you're ever likely to encounter and it's obviously more than a job to so many of you guys um, that that isn't lost on me at all my um, I suppose final thought is um, I remember if I think back to a long way around things that inspired me people that inspired me programs 
I remember, and you may remember, Eddie Izzard, he did 27 marathons in 27 days um, to, um, as a tribute to Nelson Mandela for his incarceration. And at, towards his end and after all these struggles, he, he was talking about how, how he'd encountered so much abuse in his life and so many challenges and so many people being quite vitriolic and quite rude to him um, about his cross-dressing, about his sexual preference and all these things and all these things that people are interested in. And he said, and excuse me for swearing, he said, fuck them. It absolutely doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your sexual preference is or what you're interested in. All that matters is what are you doing to make a difference? He was cycling and raising awareness for sport relief. He was making a difference. And he said the only thing, the most important thing beyond any of that material cosmetic stuff is what is it you guys do? What is it you do to make a difference? How do you help others? And what is your place here? What are you doing? Everyone, I think, and everyone in this room, all doctors, nurses, clinical nurse specialists, um, are all helping all those nurses who look after people with leukemia and beyond for all different illnesses, they're all making that difference. They're all spending their life making that difference for people like me who needed it back then, but I think more importantly, it's for people who need it today. That's it, thank you. <laughs>